the bird see uh, optic flow from both walls because the stripes are perpendicular to the direction of motion. In this case, this wall shows perpendicular stripes. This wall has axial stripes, parallel stripes. So if you move parallel to the actual stripes, you see virtually no optic flow, right? And vice versa over here. So let's see what this bird does. This is a budgerigar, by the way, an iconic Australian bird, easy to train, easy to maintain. So he's flying down the middle because he's balancing the flow uh, on the two sides. Now, in this case, bird flying a lot closer to the wall with the horizontal stripes because that wall is producing no flow. So it produces the illusion of being something that's very far away. So this bird is actually scraping its wings almost, and that, that wall is flying down. And the opposite thing happens here. So it looks as though uh, birds do, at least some of the birds, uh, at least these birds, uh, use principles similar to bees when they fly down and negotiate uh, narrow passages. Now, what happens when you try to uh, get a, a bird to fly through a, a really narrow passage? I mean, a really, really narrow passage. Let's see what happens here. Is this screen bright enough, by the way? Can you see what's going on? OK. Yeah. OK. Oops. Sorry. So what, uh, so what we're finding is that birds are very body aware. Um, you know, weighs about 10 milligrams. How, how on earth do they do this? I mean, do they have any clever tricks and algorithms that they use? That's something we'd like to learn about as, as, as just as curious biologists. That's one of the uh, uh, aims of our lab. Uh, and the other aim is if we do find something neat and cool that they do uh, that we hadn't thought about as engineers before, then can we copy them into novel kinds of biologically inspired algorithms for guiding autonomous aerial vehicles? Those are the two aspects of our lab that I hope to be able to uh, tell you about today. Now, before I go any further, this is a snapshot of some of the folks in our lab. Um, roughly half of them are biologists. The other half are engineers and computer scientists. So we have a nice mix of people. So one half does the, uh, does the science, and the other half does the engineering. And there's a lot of interaction going on. So there is, as, as you mentioned, a lot of uh, self-interaction. Um, now, one of the, uh, some, of the, some of the differences between insect vision uh, and our own vision, uh, as you know, insects have compound eyes, uh, which are optically uh, somewhat different from our own eyes. Uh, we have a single lens with the retina behind it, so it's rather like a camera, a lens focusing light onto about 100 million receptors. Um, insects, on the other hand, have a large number of small eyes. Uh, each one of them is called an omatidium. Uh, and it consists of a small lens that focuses light onto a small group of photoreceptors, typically between six and nine. Uh, and each omatidium looks in a slightly different direction in space. Each one has a visual field of about two degrees in the case of a bee. And each omatidium is separated from its neighbor by about two degrees. OK? So there's about 5,000 omatidia in one eye and a similar number in the other eye. So the entire constellation of um, 10,000 omatidia is giving the insect uh, a panoramic view of the world, pretty much panoramic, except for a small region in the back where the body gets in the way. So there's a blind zone in the back. But apart from that, there's almost full panoramic vision. Also, within each one of these omatidia, in the case of the bee, you have three kinds of color photoreceptors. You have uh, green photoreceptors, you have blue photoreceptors, and you have UV photoreceptors. So there's beautiful trichromatic color vision happening within each facet. So if you wanted to represent that sort of way in which the insect acquires the world, it would be something like a pointillistic representation, a panoramic pointillistic representation of the world. That's how the insect is actually capturing uh, its view of the outside world. Now that, of course, is slightly different from the way a human being picks up this information using their simple camera eye. But that difference by itself is not a big deal. It's, it, 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 it's, an, it's an optical difference. Uh, uh, it's a superficial difference. But a much more fundamental difference between insect vision and our own vision comes about from the fact that the two eyes of an insect, when I say two eyes, I mean the, the right eye, the right compound eye, and the left compound eye, those two eyes are actually very close together. And this makes stereo vision quite difficult if you're an insect. Now, the, the reason why stereo vision works quite well in our case is that the two eyes are fairly far apart. They're about eight centimeters apart. So if I close, look at my finger and close one eye and then look at it with the other eye, and you can do it if you like, you'll find that the image of the finger actually shifts back and forth. And what your brain is doing is it's measuring that shift, or parallax, as we call it. 
and it's using simple triangulation to work out how far away the finger is, right? Now, that works fine because your two eyes are quite far apart. But imagine what would happen if you move your eyes closer and closer. That parallax shift would be smaller and smaller. Ultimately, when the two eyes are very close together, it's like having two identical images. And there's very little parallax. So you know, unless you're very close to the object, when in case the parallax, in which case the parallax builds up again, uh, for most normal ranges, it's very difficult to pick up range using stereo cues. Now, what do insects do about this? Because they don't go around bumping into obstacles. They clearly have three-dimensional vision. And part of the work in our lab has been to try and unravel how insects acquire three-dimensional perception of the world, despite the fact that they don't have any stereo. So um, now I'll give you a bit of a historical account. So some of this may be familiar to some of you folks, and I apologize for this, but I'm trying to put all of this in context. And ho hopefully towards the end of it, we'll come to some of the new stuff that uh, hopefully nobody's heard about yet. OK. <laughs> so many, many years ago now, this is 1988. Uh, this is just a chance observation, as usually happens with most of the interesting stuff. This is not something we set out to do. We were training bees to come into our lab uh, and, and participate in an experiment there. And you can do that very well, because bees are very anxious to get good sugar water food. So they'll come to you if, you've got, if the food is good enough, repeatedly, again and again. So we noticed that when they entered the lab through a hole in the window, they flew fairly precisely through the middle of the hole. In other words, they balanced the distances to the left and right hand rims of the aperture rather precisely as they uh, went, went through. Uh, and we asked ourselves, how did they do this, given the fact that they don't have stereo, to work out the ranges to these two rims, right? Well, are they doing something far simpler? Are they, for example, positioning themselves so that the speed of this rim, as seen by this eye, is equal to the speed of this rim, as seen by that eye, as the bee is flying through? If you can balance the optic flow, as they say, the speed of image motion in the two eyes, that can ensure that you fly down the middle. If one side is moving faster than the other side, it means you're flying too close to the faster side, right? So is that the way in which they steer through narrow gaps? Well, you can test that idea fairly easily by convincing bees to fly uh, through, uh, through a tunnel like this, the inside of which is lined with uh, visual texture. In this case, it's black and white stripes. You have a sugar water feeder at the far end, which I haven't showed you here. You have these bees trained, and you fly them through, and you film them with an overhead camera, their flights. And basically, you find that bees fly fairly, fairly nicely through the middle. Those green bars there depict the mean and standard, de standard deviation of several hundred flights measured in this way. There's a bit of slop there, of course. And they're not precise, but not, not totally precise. But hey, bees are only human. This is not bad for bee. I think it's not bad at all. OK, now, if you take one of these walls now, and these walls are mounted on a conveyor belt, and you move the wall in the same direction as the bee as it's coming in, uh, you find the bee flies a lot closer to the moving wall. So evidently, what's happening here is because the bee and the wall are moving in the same direction, the image velocity as seen by that eye is reduced compared to the other wall, right? So the bee thinks this particular wall is much further away, so she moves closer to that wall uh, to compensate. OK? Uh, I say she, by the way, because all the bees that we work with are females. I told you the females that do all the hard work, going out, foraging, collecting nectar, coming back home, depositing it. Uh, the males, the drones, don't do any work. And they have only one thing on their minds that it certainly isn't hard work, OK? <laughs> So it's only the females. That's why I keep saying she. OK, now, if you, if you now move this wall in the opposite direction to the incoming bee's trajectory, the bees now fly a lot further away from the moving wall. Because what's happening there is that the, the bee is moving in one direction. The wall is moving in the opposite direction. So that eye sees a huge image velocity. So the bee says, hey, there's something dangerously close here. I better move away from this wall, move away from the surface uh, to, to clear it and not bump into it. So it looks like bees are actually going through narrow passages, not by using complicated stereo mechanisms, but by actually balancing the flow on the two eyes. That's how they go through narrow passages. And in fact, if you change the, the spatial frequency, for example, the texture of the uh, patterns on the two walls, and both walls are stationary, they still fly down the middle. So they're quite robust to variations in spatial texture and variations in the contrast of these patterns. What they're actually measuring is the angle of velocity of the image in the eye quite independently of the other properties of the pattern. And this is what you would need if you want to fly reliably down the middle of, for example, between two tree trunks, where the tree trunks might have different, might be of different species, they might have different textures, the box may have different textures, right? You don't want to be fooled by that. You want something that measures angle of velocity in the eye quite reliably, irrespective of the pattern, and that's what they seem to be doing. Um, it turns out that uh, once we found this, people started to build robots uh, that navigated down corridors using the same principle. And we hadn't thought about it ourselves, but it actually seems to work quite well. And the people who built that were saying that uh, really it, measuring optic flow, computing optic flow is far simpler than computing stereo. 
to measure range. And so it provides a good way to do things uh, uh, simply. So more recently, we wondered whether uh, birds uh, use similar principles to fly down narrow passages. And uh, we flew birds down uh, tunnels. Uh, this is an overhead view of these three tunnels. And you see birds flying through them. Now, in this particular case, at this time, we were not able to move patterns in these walls. But we were able to manipulate the optic flow, um, as seen by each eye, by either having vertical stripes on, on both walls, as you see in the left-hand uh, panel here, or where's my picture? over here. Or you could have vertical stripes on one side, horizontal stripes on the other side, as you see over here, uh, or the opposite over here. So what happens here is that, of course, in this case, uh, the birds see uh, optic flow from both walls, because the stripes are perpendicular to the direction of motion. In this case, this wall shows perpendicular stripes. This wall has actual stripes, parallel stripes. So if you move parallel to the actual stripes, you see virtually no optic flow, right? And vice versa over here. So let's see what this bird does. This is a budgerigar, by the way, an iconic Australian bird, easy to train, easy to maintain. So he's flying down the middle because he's balancing the flow uh, on the two sides. Now, in this case, bird flying a lot closer to the wall with the horizontal stripes because that wall is producing no flow. So it produces the illusion of being something that's very far away. So this bird is actually scraping its wings almost, and that, that wall is flying down. And the opposite thing happens here. So it looks as though uh, birds do, at least some of the birds, uh, at least these birds, uh, use principles similar to bees when they fly down and negotiate uh, narrow passages. Now, what happens when you try to uh, get a, a bird to fly through a, a really narrow passage? I mean, a really, really narrow passage. Let's see what happens here. Is this screen bright enough, by the way? Can you see what's going on? OK. Yeah. OK. Oops. Sorry. So what, uh, so what we're finding is that birds are very body aware. Um, each bird seems to be individually aware of its own wingspan. And it'll close its wings only when the width of the gap comes to within about one or two centimeters of its wingspan. And, and large birds will close their wings at a larger you know, aperture width. Smaller birds of the same species will close their wings at a smaller, at a smaller width. So each bird, without bothering you with the details of these, that's just a a nice artistic picture of this thing. Probably belongs in the gallery here. Um, I, I don't want to bore you with the details here, but um, uh, individual birds seem to be individually aware of their own wingspan, so, which is kind of nice. So they're body aware in a very individual way. OK, let's turn to another thing that uh, a lot of flying creatures do, and this is, this is landing. Um, landing, how, do, how does an insect move and make a nice, smooth landing on, on a surface? Landing is a tricky job because, as you know, as you get closer and closer to the ground, you've got to decelerate appropriately so you don't smack into the ground. Uh, this is why they pay pilots so much. Um, but how does an insect do it? So, um, by the way, the deceleration has to be appropriate. It can't be too rapid because then you come to a halt, hover uh, high above the ground, and that's not, that's not good either. That's awkward. That's embarrassing. That's not cool, right? You have to time it properly so you do a nice smooth landing and your velocity is zero just close to the point when you make a touchdown, right? So how do you do that? So um, we simply filmed bees coming and landing on a textured, visually textured surface, something like this, this uh, platform over here, place a drop of sugar water, have them come and land, and then we film their trajectories uh, with, uh, with cameras, uh, high-speed motion cameras, uh, and reconstruct the trajectory in three dimensions. Um, where for each one of these trajectories, we measure the height above the surface, as you see over here, see how that decreases as a function of time. You look at the forward speed, see how that changes as a function of time. You look at the descent speed, see how that evolves, and also look at the descent angle, all right? So we do that. Um, uh, the most um, compelling and consistent observation to come out of this is shown in, the next, uh, in this next slide here with four examples. Uh, and what we're plotting here is the horizontal component of the flight speed of the bee as it's coming into land um, versus its height above the surface. And what this graph is telling you is that when the bee is flying high, it's flying fast. When it's flying low, it's flying slow. OK, that's just one simple observation. But the other thing, the fact that this relationship is linear tells you that it's keeping the angular velocity of the image of the ground constant as it's coming into land. So as you come into land, as you approach a target, if you adjust the forward speed so that the velocity of the ground, as seen by your eye, appears to be constant as you come in, then you will automatically slow down as you get closer and closer to the ground. 
So finally, when you're just about to make a touchdown, you're flying with almost zero speed, so you don't burn your feet when you make contact with the ground, all right? So you think about this, it's actually a really nice um, autopilot because you don't need to know how far away you are from the ground at any instant, right, with this method. So you don't need any sonar, stereo, no ranging methods. You also don't need to know how fast you're approaching the ground. All you have to do is to measure the optic flow produced by the, by, by the ground and keep that constant as you're approaching the target and you automatically come to a, come to a, come to a smooth landing. It's, it's, a beautiful, it's almost like magic, but it actually works. Okay, and, and, and I'll show you later some of our attempts at uh, putting some of this into aircraft to see if we can get them to work in the same way. Now, that was, that was so far, that was for landing on a horizontal surface where the optic flow that the insect approaches is translational going from front to back. But insects will not just land on horizontal surfaces, they'll land on vertical surfaces, walls, hives, flowers. Uh, what do they do then? Do they need to have a different strategy for every surface that they encounter? That seems difficult. I mean, uh, we, we don't like that. We like one simple, elegant rule, right? So anyway, we'd like to, we'd next we look to, look to see what they do when they approach a vertical surface to dock on it. Land, for example, in a, at, a, at a hole in a nest, for example, in a tree trunk. How do they approach when they land this way? Now, of course, the pattern of optic flow is quite different when you approach a vertical surface because it's a pattern of expansion. The image expands about the, about the point of focus. About, about the focal point. So it's like watching a, a Star Wars movie, for example. That's what the bee is experiencing. It's coming into land, right? In a vertical surface. So here's the experiment. We train bees to come in. Uh, and there's a, there's a YMS cage over here, a loose YMS cage. It doesn't have to be a bee-tight cage. But they're trained to come in through this aperture here, fly in, land uh, at the center of this pattern here, the spiral. I'll tell you why it's a spiral in a moment. Um, and they, whoops, what happened to my cursor? Yeah. They, they crawl through a tube there. And at the back of it is a sugar water feeder. That's where they get their food, and they go back again and come back again and again. And as they're coming into land, we film their trajectories in three, dim three dimensions and reconstruct them. Now, if you do that, here's what you find. So if you plot the distance of the bee from the target as a function of time, it's a beautiful exponential function. So um, those red circles, if, if you can see them, uh, are the mean velocity measurements, or sorry, distance measurements. Uh, as a function of time, um, the, the the blue the blue curve is the exponential fit, uh, and the and the green bars are the standard deviations for each data point. So it fits this thing. It fits an exponential really nicely, and this tells us that in this case the bees are keeping. Well, we don't want to go into the modeling, but it, it'll be quite obvious to you when I mention what the outcome is. They're keeping the rate of expansion of the image constant as they come in. So if you came in, if you came in at a constant speed, then as you get closer and closer to the surface the surfaces appear to expand faster and faster, right? But if you don't allow that to happen, keep the rate of expansion constant, then you'll automatically slow down in exactly the same way as the bee that's landing on the horizontal surface, and it'll do exactly the same job, okay? Now, let's, if, are they really measuring the rate of expansion and controlling it? And this is why we use the spiral, because with the spiral, you can manipulate artificially the rate of expansion or contraction as they're coming into land. So here's what happens with the spiral. If you test them with a spiral that's stationary, you get the same curve as, as you saw before. This is the blue curve. If you spin the spiral so as to make it appear to expand, you're augmenting the rate of expansion. The bees hit the brakes. They're coming a lot more slowly. That's the green curve. It's still an exponential curve, but with a longer time constant. And if you spin it the other way so as to make it contract, appear to contract, then they get sucked in. They come in, they virtually sort of crash into the wall. Uh, we're not actually having fun, uh, you know, fooling, with, fooling these bees like this. This is telling us something interesting because if you suspect that it is the rate of expansion that they're keeping constant, then the way to test it and to prove it is to manipulate that cue, right? And see if it changes the behavior in the expected way. And that's what we find. So um, regardless of whether they're uh, flying towards a static spiral, an expanding spiral, or a contracting spiral, if you look at the rate of expansion that the bees are holding as they come in, it's pretty constant. That's shown by the three horizontal curves curves over here. They're maintaining that at, at a speed of about two, at a rate of expansion of about 200 degrees per second. Whereas if they'd come in at a constant speed, that's what would have happened to the rate of expansion. It would have blown up. They're not allowing that to happen. They're just keeping that rate of expansion constant as they come in, and that's what ensures a, a smooth landing. Um, now, you might ask me, what's going on here, Srini? You know, they, when, when, when you say when they're landing on a horizontal surface, they're keeping the translational velocity constant. When they land on the vertical surface, they're measuring the rate of expansion, keeping that constant. Wait a minute, there's different strategies. What's going on here? Well, I, we think it's all part of the same strategy. It doesn't matter whether you're measuring expansion or translation. All you have to do is to aim at a target, right? Measure the optic flow around it that you're generating by approaching it, and hold that optic flow, whatever it is, 
hold it constant as you're coming into land. Hold the magnitude constant, right? If you happen to be approaching, landing on a horizontal surface, making a grazing landing, then the optic flow is almost purely translational. If you're approaching it vertically like this, it's mostly expansional. Doesn't matter what it is. If it's oblique, if it's a 45 degree thing, it's a combination of translation and rotation and translation and expansion. Doesn't matter what it is. Whatever it is, keep that thing constant as you come into land and you get the same behavior in all those cases, right? That's our working hypothesis that with sort of at, at the moment for how bees make these landings. We don't know, we're not sure yet, but that's what we think is going on so far. Okay, here now let's turn to another question. This has to do with um, working out how, how does a honeybee work out how far it's gone uh, to find a food source? Because as many of you would know, uh, when the bee comes back, it has to report to the other bees through its uh, dance, to its ritualized uh, waggle dance, as it's known, uh, how far away the food source is and in what direction these other bees should fly uh, to get to the food source. So odometry is a pretty important feature for a bee to have, uh, not just for telling other bees where to go, but also it has to go back to the food source itself if it's found a good food source. It has to know how far to fly to get back to the food source, right? So how does the bee's odometer work? Now, before we go into that, of course, I have to tell you a little bit about the dance. Some of you may be familiar with the dance, but may, may, some of you may be not. So this dance, when a bee finds a good food source, uh, she comes back home and does a, a figure of eight kind of dance on the vertical surface of the honeycomb. So this figure of eight consists of um, alternating left and right hand sort of loops like this, circuits. And every time she finishes one of these loops, she waggles her abdomen from side to side. And it's called this waggle phase. That's the waggle phase of the dance. And this waggle phase tells the other bees the distance to the food source. So the distance is proportional to the duration of the waggle phase. So the longer the waggle phase, um, the further away the uh, food source. So you can do a simple experiment where you place uh, an artificial sugar water feeder some distance from a hive. You train bees to come to the feeder and measure the waggle duration when they're dancing, and then move this feeder further and further away progressively, measure the waggle duration, and you'll find a roughly linear relationship between distance and waggle duration. So distance to the food source is encoded uh, in terms of waggle duration. Now the direction to the food source is also encoded uh, in terms of the waggle, and this is done in terms of the orientation of this waggle axis. Now this is very interesting, it's a very symbolic representation because the vertically upward direction symbolizes the direction of the sun. And this is down, dance is done in the dark, by the way, so the bees can't see the sun. They can't even see each other dancing. It's mostly through vibrations that they, they pick, pick this dance up. But they're sensing the direction of gravity, and that, that we won't go into that, but they've got ways of sensing the direction of gravity. So the direction of negative gravity symbolizes the direction of the sun. So if this waggle phase now is inclined 40 degrees clockwise with respect to the vertical direction, it means that these other bees, recruited bees, should fly at an azimuthal direction that's 40 degrees clockwise with respect to the azimuthal direction of the sun. Okay, so that, that, that's how they signal the direction of the, sun, the, the food source in terms of the, a sun compass. Okay, so, so the position of the food source is signaled in polar coordinates, uh, distance through the waggle direction, and direction through this direction of the waggle axis. So that's how the, uh, the dance uh, six, six signal works. Now this here is an example of a waggle dance. Uh, this yellow mark B is the one who is dancing. And as you can see, every time she faces roughly vertical is when she waggles, right? Okay, so this is, she's telling the other bees to go now vertically upward means directly in the direction of the sun. So she says, go in the direction of the sun, uh, and an experienced waggle dance, uh, bee dance watcher would tell you that this food source is probably about 200 meters away. So if, if, if you were to go uh, 200 meters in the direction of the sun and wait for a while, you'd probably find this marked bee visiting a bush somewhere near there. So it's a fairly precise indication of how far away the food source is and how to, how to get there. Now you'll also notice that um, um, in the middle of the dance, uh, the bee pauses and interacts with some of the other bees. Uh, what's happening there is that these other bees are begging her for nectar samples from where she's come back from. And so they can evaluate, not just, well, they can evaluate the nectar too to judge whether it's worthwhile to go there. Uh, they're getting information about how far away the food source is and how good the food source is. And it looks like bees are making these trade-offs between do I fly a long distance to get to a, a good food source or do I fly a short distance to get to a you know, not so good food source. And there's a, there's a, there's a trade-off there, right? And it looks like they're really trying to maximize the ratios of calories brought in 
to calories expended to get the food. That's what they seem to be doing. It's instinctive. It's not uh, bad, nothing, nothing that they're consciously doing. But the other thing, I just briefly mentioned this. I won't get into this aspect of consciousness in bees anymore. But someone, uh, James Neer, does some lovely uh, work some time ago, two or three years ago, where he found that quite often when a bee comes back and dances to advertise a food source, and another bee who's been there has encountered danger at that food source in the form of a spider that's attacked it and wounded it then this bee will headbutt this dancing bee and stop it from dancing and advertising this food source and stop the recruitment. And this headbutting is specific, specific to that particular location. Now, it's kind of intriguing. I'll just leave that thought with you. <laughs> to believe that all of this is done by, by truly autonomous creatures seems a bit hard to believe, but anyway. I'll just leave that thought with you. We won't pursue that any further. Okay, a little d detail here about, about this dance now. Um, this is the waggle dance that I told you, and this waggle dance typically happens when the food source is uh, quite some distance away, typically uh, much, uh, the distance much bigger than 50 meters. Um, but when the food source is very close to the hive, that waggle face disappears, and you just get a series of loops like this uh, without the waggle face. And this, the code for this dance, which is called a round dance, is that the food source is very close to the hive. I'm not gonna tell you exactly where it is, guys, but just look around the radius about 50 meters, and you'll find the food source. So that's the code for the round dance. So the waggle dance conveys distance and direction when the food source is far away, and the round dance so just says that something is very close to the hive. Now, armed with these two bits of information, we can now uh, put these bees into interesting situations in the lab where we make them fly through, for example, narrow, short, narrow tunnels, and see what they do when they come back uh, home and dance, because it's a, the bee dance is the wonderful kind of window into the bee's mind, because you can manipulate the bee's perception. It tells you about the bee's perception of how far it thinks it has traveled and the various situations you put it into in your lab, right? <laughs> so here's, here's one simple experiment. We take a hive. This is now placed outdoors. We have this tunnel, which is a very short tunnel, only six meters long, uh, and it's narrow. It's about 10 centimeters wide, about 20 centimeters tall, narrow tunnel. And we start by placing the bee, a feeder, sugar training, to come, training the bees to come to sugar water feeder that's fairly close to the hive. This, this tunnel, by the way, the entrance, the mouth of this tunnel is only about three meters away from the hive. So we place the feeder here. So the bees are emerging, flying about three meters to this feeder, feeding, going back home, and dancing. And we measure their dances. And they're doing a round dance, as you'd expect, because the feeder is very close by. It's really very close. It's within stinging distance, so to speak. It's very close. OK, now we take this feeder and move it step by step down the tunnel. And of course, the bees will follow. But what you also do is cover the top of the tunnel with a sheet of plexiglass or insect screen to make sure the bees don't cheat and take a shortcut by flying outdoors like this and coming in like that. So you really want them to enter the tunnel and fly through the tunnel all the way. Yeah, you want them to experience the tunnel in its full uh, glory, so to speak. OK, now they're trained and they're coming to the end of this tunnel, which is six meters length over here. Um, and, uh, and they're going back home and dancing. And now, but now, guess what they're reporting? They're reporting something like 200 meters. They've massively overestimated how far they've flown. Now, what is going on here? Now, we think what is going on here is that they're actually measuring the amount of image motion that they experience on the way to the food source, integrating the optic flow over time, and using that to gauge how far they've flown. Now, because they're flying in a narrow, tight tunnel, even a small amount of forward motion causes a huge amount of backward motion of the image of the tunnel. So we when you integrate that over time, you think you've gone a long way. So it's a bit like, you know, if I were to fly from uh, Milan to Rome and look at the ground beneath me, the ground is so far away, it doesn't appear to move much at all, so I don't think I've gone a long way. But on the other hand, if I were to drive from Milan to Rome, everything is close to me, there's a huge amount of image motion, and I think I've gone a long way. Okay, if that's really the case, then you can test that quite easily by depriving the bees, these bees of optic flow when they've flown the same distance. And that's what's being done in this third experiment here, where these bees are now flying down the same tunnel, same length, but the stripes are not vertical, they're horizontal. So they're flying through either a tunnel that's blank or flying through a tunnel that has actual horizontal stripes. There's no optic flow, and, and look, they're, they're doing a round dance back again. So even though they've flown physically the same distance, 
the odometer is not ticking anymore because there's no optic flow, so it seems they haven't gone any, any distance at all. So this thing really tells us, I think, that these bees really are not measuring, for example, energy consumption to work out how far they've flown, because that was one of the um, uh, hypotheses put forward by earlier people working in this field, including the uh, Nobel laureate Carl von Frisch. He did some very clever experiments. Uh, he, he trained bees outdoors to go from a hive to a feeder 500 meters away. He, they signaled 500 meters. Then he put tiny weights uh, on these bees and made them fly the same distance. And they signal a much bigger distance. And he said, aha, they must be measuring energy consumed because they're carrying this weight. Made sense, right? It turns out what happens is when you weight a bee, it tends to fly closer to the ground. That increases the optic flow produced by the ground. <laughs> and so you could, when you, when you adjust one, change one experimental variable, you've got to make sure you don't change other variables at the same time. So that, that's what we think is going on there. So it looks like, at least for, um, for uh, small to moderate distances, it looks like the primary QBs are using is something that's visual and involves measuring the integrated optic flow. So for very long, large distances, I'm not sure. It could still be some measure of energy consumption. I mean, certainly if you and I went a long distance, we'd feel tired. I mean, we would have some idea of how, far, how, how, how much energy we consume. And I, I find it hard to believe we won't use that cue, right? So, but at least for short to medium distances, it seems like visual cues are the most important. And so we can now calibrate the honeybee's odometer, not, not in terms of distance per se, distance units per se, but in terms of units of optic flow, units of image motion experienced by the eye. So we can say one millisecond of waggle duration corresponds to 18 degrees of image motion in the eye, for example. Now, um, little side question here. How do the recruits respond to this dancing bee when it's coming back with and conveying this wrong information? Uh, do they believe it at all? What do they do? Well, here's an experiment to test that, and this experiment is, the numbers are slightly different because this was done not in Australia but in Germany uh, with some of our collaborators. And there we have an eight-meter tunnel. Bees are coming back and dancing and signaling a distance of something like 140 meters in this case, still an exaggerated distance. You can now ask, where do the recruits go? Do they, when they, do they believe these dance, first of all? And if so, where do they go? And if you, you can test this and examine this by placing a large number of, uh, a series of feeders, empty dummy feeders, at various places along this line, far out, of course, and, and have one person stationed at each one of these feeders, monitoring how many bees, how many recruited bees arrive at each feeder. Uh, and it turns out that the maximum number of uh, recruits searching happens at a distance of about 140 meters. So these recruited bees are certainly believing the dance, taking it literally for what it is, and, and paying attention to it and doing exactly what, what the bees are telling them to do. Now, this is kind of interesting. So they're, they're not, uh, you can say, okay, the bees are being, uh, okay, the other interesting thing is that if you know, take these bees that have been, that have been trained and then suddenly remove this tunnel, what, what do you think the trained bees would do? They actually search, also search at 140 meters because, you know, if you come out of the hive, and you don't find the tunnel anymore, the, the one that you used to go through, what's the next best thing to do? You fly, and you play out the amount of optic flow that you expe expect to experience, and because you're now flying outdoors, everything is much further away, so you have to fly that much further away to, to get to the food source, right? To get to where you think the food source is. So that's what they're doing. So clearly the other bees are believing this da the dance that's being produced. And this is kind of, again, we're not just fooling bees by doing all this. This is an interesting controversy that's been there festering for a long period now. Ever since Carl von Frisch, who you know, won the Nobel Prize for working out the meaning of this dance, sim the symbolic meaning of this dance, people, there's a school of people who didn't want to believe it. Uh, they said, oh, this is too exotic, too fancy. Um, you can't imagine a, a simple thing like a bee in, engaging in this kind of language. So they said, oh, maybe there are other cues bees are using. They may be following each other using scent cues or following each other visually, right, which is possible. But this experiment shows that that's not possible because if the bees really were following the, the, trained, the trained bees, they'd all end up here. But they're not doing that, right? They're going out there. So clearly, uh, Von Frisch is right about that. Uh, and uh, so that, that settles that controversy once and for all. OK, I think uh, we will uh, probably stop here and then go into some of the um, um, the applications-oriented aspect of our work. Now, the, the reason why we do uh, uh, biorobotics, as we call it, uh, there's two reasons. One is, the main reason is to try and see whether if we think bees are behaving in a certain way and we think they're using certain cues, uh, the best way to test that is to put it into a real uh, flying vehicle and see how it behaves. You can do simulations, of course, and they, they help to some extent. 
Uh, but the real test is to really put it into a real machine and see whether you can get it to behave in a, in a recent way. If, if it doesn't, then you know something is wrong with your hypothesis, your biological hypothesis, and you go back and reevaluate it. So that's one reason why we do it. The other reason is maybe we will find something occasionally that's kind of unexpected, interesting, and maybe we can use it for some technological application. So that's the other goal as well. But that's not the main goal. The main goal is really um, the science behind it. So we certainly in our biorobotics, by the way, we're not being um, slavishly uh, biomimetic. So we're not uh, building compound eyes. Uh, we're not building flapping wing vehicles. Um, we're just extracting uh, what we think are the important visual cues that bees are using to navigate, putting them into standard aircraft, you know, off-the-shelf aircraft that we can get, uh, and seeing whether these algorithms, how well or how badly these algorithms fare uh, when we put them in that sort of context. So now one of the, thing, the neat things you can do, one things you can think of doing is, is doing, for example, something like maintaining a constant height above the ground uh, using optical flow. Uh, if you want to do terrain following, for example, you want to fly as close as possible uh, to the ground and follow the map of the earth, as they say. Um, uh, you can do that. If you know your flight speed, then you can measure the optic flow and calibrate height for optic flow and keep the optic flow at a desired level and then maintain the desired height above the ground. So the optic flow is too high, it means you're flying a bit too low, you raise your altitude. If it's too low, you lower your altitude by putting your nose down, right? So optic flow regulation is a good way, one way anyway, of measuring uh, your height above the ground and keeping it constant. This kind of thing is of interest to the Air Force, by the way, because uh, they would prefer not using radar. Radar emits active radiation, and you don't want to do that. You give yourself away to the enemy. Something that's passive, lightweight, and cheap uh, is desirable. So. You can do this using a video camera pointed down at the ground, measure the optic flow. Um, one of the problems, if you're, if you're a jet, high-speed jet that's moving quite fast, uh, the image of the ground below you is moving at a very high speed, okay? <laughs> so if you have a standard video camera running at 25 frames a second, successive frames will be completely uncorrelated. There'll be no, there'll be no overlap. So one way is to increase the frame rate of your camera, but the other way is to actually use a curved mirror, um, you know, a, a convex mirror slows down the rate of image motion, and you can use that to make, you don't view the look at the ground directly beneath you, but you look at it via a curved mirror, and that slows down image motion. The other neat thing about a curved mirror is that once you decide to use a curved mirror, you can tailor the shape of the mirror to get rid of the perspective distortion that is normally produced when you look at the ground straight down. Because if I were to look at the ground straight down, then the ground directly beneath me is moving at a very high rate, and the ground much further in front of me is moving at a much lower rate, angular rate, right? So you've got a gradient of optical flow, which is harder to compute exactly, right? So what this does is you can tailor the shape so as to undistort that distortion and, and, and to make the, make the optics do that work for you. So that's what we're doing. We're tailoring the shape, uh, measuring the profile, uh, adjusting the profile, calculating the profile to achieve that. I won't go into the details of this, but that's what this looks like. So for example, if, this, if you're flying above a horizontal plane like this, a checkered plane, and you're looking at, at, at the world through this specially shaped mirror, which is really a curved mirror like this, that's how it'll look inside the, the view of the world will look inside the mirror. And if you take that image and unwarp it in this way, you know, this is, this is a azimuth and elevation, then you find that these checks all have the same height over here, which means the optic flow measured along each one of these rows will be constant, independent of the height at which you measure the optic flow. So it's done that, it's undistorted that aspect of the distortion for you. Uh, another si interesting side effect of, uh, of mapping the world or viewing the world in this way is that it defines for you automatically uh, a kind of the radius of a collision-free cylinder through which you can fly safely in, in the environment without hurting yourself. So if you look at the maximum optic flow that's generated in this, in this image here, in this, in this, uh, in, in this uh, unwarped image, uh, that defines for you uh, the radius of the hole through which you can fly. So it'll tell you whether you can fly through this gorge, for example, without hurting your wingtips. So it's a nice way to look at the world, and the, the, this transform is a nice way to look at the world. So here's, here's a, a view of this um, um, a camera pointing at one of these surfaces mounted on the underside of an aircraft. Um, and this is a flight, um, just a manual flight. Uh, as seen by this uh, mirror as we come in. We're coming into land. These are the instantaneous optic flow vectors plotted in real time. As you get come, come closer and closer to the ground, of course, the optic flow is getting bigger and bigger. That's because the pilot is not reducing his speed. He's not behaving like a bee. He's coming in at a constant speed uh, to land, right? Now, one of the things, um, one of the difficult things about working with the raw optic flow like this uh, is that the optic flow you get, 
See, the distance to the ground is only given by the translational component of your, of your motion. The rotary components don't tell you anything about how far away the ground is, because if I rotate, every point in the environment moves at the same angle of velocity. There's no information about range. It's only the translation that gives me information about range. Something that's very close to me appears to move very fast. Things that are very far away uh, don't appear to move far away much at all. So it's, it's a translatory information that tells me information about range. So what I've got to do is to remove the rotary component of the optic flow and then analyze what's remaining to get information on range. Does that make sense? By the way, please stop and ask me questions if you want. This is the last talk, so we can keep it informal if you like. <laughs> is that okay, Paul? <laughs> so yeah, please stop and ask me any questions if you have any questions. So how do you tease, tease out, get, take away, peel off the rotational components of it? There's a couple of ways in which you can do it. One is to actually measure your rotational rate using gyroscopes. And once you do that, you know what the optic flow patterns will be, and you can take them off, right? You can do it that way. Or here's another way, which is sort of a bit of cheating, I think, but anyway, it works. And this is to make what I call a virtual translation. So I've got two versions of this mirror, two replicas of the system, one here, one there. They arrange coaxially, one in front of the other. And this, is, this replicates the two images that, I've obtained, that I would have obtained had I made a pure translation going from here to there without doing any rotations, right? So this is the virtual translation. So if I measure the, the apparent optic flow between these two images at the same instant of time, I've got to me this translational optic flow, the pure translational optic flow, because that's what I'm mimicking here by having these two systems, right? So in a way, I'm extracting optic flow, translational optic flow, without actually doing the translation. It's a funny kind of stereo is what it is, OK? And I'm using that to work out how far away things are. And again, because I'm using the same geometry, I've still got the same collision-free cylinder. OK, so here's the system uh, mounted on the, on the nose of an aircraft. It's a standard aircraft, uh, which is um, all we've done is uh, taken the, the engine away from the front nose which, uh, and put it on the wing so to make room for the vision system in front so it can see everything without having any occlusions. And um, OK, this is now the, a test of the optical detection system. This is now just a walk through an airfield. And, and uh, remember, this is this cylinder. This is a collision-free cylinder. So this red part of the environment is actually penetrating that cylinder. And it's, it's everything that's within a radius of 0 to 2 meters is being signaled in red. Radius of between 2 and 3, three meters is being signaled in blue. And 3 meters and beyond 3 to 5 is being signaled as green. And everything else is not being signaled. So you can see that things are penetrating a cylinder. And uh, my colleague Dean is actually penetrated too because he's now seen as a dangerous object that is potentially hit it. So that's how this collision-free cylinder uh, works, right, in, in, in space, in, in real time. So now this is what's going on to the aircraft. Um, and here's a test of a collision avoidance thing. So basically what's happening is that the plane has been taken off under manual control, and the pilot is pointing it at this tree, uh, releasing control to the collision avoidance system, and it's literally actually moving away from that region that's producing high optic flow and avoiding the collision that way. So that, that seems to work quite reliably. You can also use uh, the same concept of this collision-free cylinder to do the terrain following, because you set the radius of the cylinder, and you fly in such a way as to scrape the cylinder as you keep going on the ground. That means you're at a constant height above the ground, right? And that achieves ter terrain following. So what the pilot is doing here is when he's flying it manually, he's, of course, he's manhandling the plane. He's throwing it all over the place. He's doing stuff like that. But the moment he releases to automatic control, see, it's meant to hold a height of 10 meters above the ground and stabilize its roll and pitch as well using optic flow information. And that's what it's doing. So what he does is he takes, he takes it to manual control and releases it in some very awkward, unusual, uh, difficult orientation to test how well the system can recover and get it back into level flight and at the desired height above the ground. That seems to work quite nicely. I'll show you some of the, uh, that's just an animation of the same thing. Uh, I won't repeat that. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that's some of the performance results. So uh, the, the black trace, by the way, the pink regions are the uh, automatic control, regions of automatic control. So within each pink zone, the, the black trace shows the height above the ground. So as soon as you get into the pink uh, region, where it's under automatic control, you can see that the height gets brought to the desired value of 10 meters above the ground. And the pitch, which is the which is blue trace here, is moving all over the place when the pilot is flying, is automatic, uh, pilot is flying it manually because he's just, he's just manhandling the aircraft. Uh, but when he release it to, uh, releases it to automatic control, it gets brought back, brought back to zero, very close to zero. Here again, see, you've got this very bad, big deviation which got, gets controlled and got back to zero when it's in the automatic mode. 
Okay, now we've also got bees, as you, some of you may know, have not only these uh, beautiful compound eyes, but they also have these three other simple camera-like eyes, and they are called the uh, uh, ocelli. And, and these uh, light-sensitive organs um, are taught to, to, to scan the horizon and help the uh, animal stabilize its attitude. So basically, there's a right-looking ocellus and a left we're looking at this. And if the horizon is level on both of them, it means my roll attitude is level. If the horizon has gone up in this side and gone down in this side, it means I've rolled this way, yeah, and vice versa. There's also an ocellus in front, which looks at the horizon in front. And if that uh, horizon goes down, it means I've pitched up. If it goes up, it means I've pitched down. So I can monitor the horizon in the frontal ocellus and use that to control the pitch attitude of my aircraft. So I can control roll. Uh, and pitch using using this uh, horizon sensing. Um, so uh, here's a modified view of, of, uh, of our vision system now. This is Mark II. That's the BI with the two compound eyes. Uh, now that's a, a Da Vinci-esque sketch of this, this vision system here. It's really two, two cameras, each with a fairly wide field of view, uh, more than a hemisphere actually, 190 degrees field of view. This one here and that one there. Uh, that's the real view of this thing. And this is an engineering drawing of this thing. So these two uh, cameras together uh, endow uh, the vision system with an almost panoramic view of the world, uh, except for a small region in the back where the fuselage actually gets in the way. But these are the views from the two, 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 two cameras. When you stitch them together to produce, this is now um, azimuth over here, elevation over here. That's the panoramic view. Uh, and there's a small region of stereo overlap here, just the way you have in a, in a real B. Um, and what you can do is, um, before I start that, um, you can look, use the horizon profile to monitor your attitude. So uh, because, as I said, you can track the horizon profile. Uh, you can segment the horizon. So you can use color information, making use of the fact that the sky is mostly blue or white, uh, and the ground is mostly green or mostly brown, I guess, in Australia. Um, you can use chromatic information to separate the uh, sky from the ground. You can also make this algorithm, segmentation algorithm, adaptive. So as the aircraft moves through uh, different kinds of terrain, it can update its, uh, its classification parameters and adapt to the, to the, to the environment. Um, and we're comparing the performance of this system in signaling the orientation of the uh, aircraft uh, with the standard techniques, for example, which is the inertial system using gyros and IMUs, which is a standard technique. And we find that this system actually works more accurately as you would expect, because gyros are rate, rate instruments, and they, they accumulate error with time, and, and, they, and they gradually get worse and worse. Whereas this one works on an absolute reference. So as long as you're flying high above the ground and the horizon is not distorted by hills and things like that, you can get a very good estimate of what is really level. So here's what's happening. Um, we're taking off. This is now just an open loop flight. Pilot is flying it. Um, now, the, the red, the red, um, the red bar there, the red rod, which you can see sometimes, signals the vertically upward direction of the aircraft. Well, it, it, it's upward, local vertically upward direction. And the, and the um, green one signals that up direction that's signaled by the inertial system. So, and it turns out, oh, that was a loop, by the way. Um, so it, it, it looks like it is working actually very well and working much better than the traditional uh, gyroscopic system. So uh, that's just a test of this system. Um, you can also use, okay, this tells you about yaw, uh, sorry, this tells you about roll and pitch, uh, but it doesn't tell you about yaw. Now, for yaw, you can use either the sun compass, as, as, as bees do, uh, look at the sky and look at the sky and see where that is, or if the sun is hidden by a cloud, uh, you can use the cloud pattern in the sky, and if the clouds don't move very much during the course of your flight, if, let's say your flight is happening over uh, five minutes, and if it's not a very windy day, you can treat the clouds as being a static pattern, and you can use that to orient your yaw quite nicely, it turns out. Um, and that's what the system is doing. It's actually building up a template of the cloud pattern in the sky, the, the entire pattern. If the sun is there, the sun is also included, right? And what's nice about the sky is that everything is far, infinitely far away, so you're measuring just the rotations. The image of the sky is not distorted by any translatory components of your motion. You can fly as fast as you want, Nothing in the sky image is going to change. It's only rotations that are being sensed by whatever is in the sky image, right? So it's a nice way of separating rotations from translations. So you can get your, your pitch and roll by you using the horizon information to work out your roll and uh, pitch and using looking at how the cloud pattern shifts along your azimuth to measure your yaw. Okay? 
So you've got uh, control over all three degrees of freedom of rotation, and you can control the aircraft, command it to various uh, your orientations by using that information, and that's what, what you see over here. Um, not only that, um, you can use the horizon profile uh, to make the aircraft do um, various aerobatic maneuvers. Because if I want to do, for example, a loop, all I have to do is to program the aircraft to servo in on a series of commanded horizon profiles. I can tell it at time t equals one second, I want the horizon profile to look like this. Time t equals two seconds, I want it to look like this, and so on and so on, and make it follow that, track that horizon profile, and you've done the maneuver. So here's, here's for example, a loop that's being done that way. So the pilot has uh, brought it into a particular um, position, attitude, and released it to the autopilot and told it to execute a loop. Uh, and here's what it does. It's easier than we thought. I mean, uh, we didn't think it was going to be that easy. But, uh, maybe the secret is to just do it fast enough that it doesn't crash. But just do it quick enough and it's back in its original position. So it seems to work surprisingly well. We don't know if insects use this to do their aerobatic maneuvers, but certainly it's uh, something you can do uh, with, a, with a model aircraft. Um, here's another example of an interesting Immelman, uh, aerobatic maneuver. It's called an Immelman maneuver. And this was invented, I think, by the Germans in World War I, maybe? So two, two, okay, thank you. So the idea is if you're being followed by, oh, is it one or two? Or there's a, someone says two, someone says one. Okay, sorry, I take your advice, I'm not sure. But the idea is that if you're being followed by another pilot and you want to get him off your tail as quickly as possible, one way to do that is to do this immelman maneuver and the idea is to do a half loop followed by a half roll and then before you know it, you're flying in the opposite direction and so unless your follower also knows how to do an Immelman turn, it'll be a long time before he can catch up with you, right? So that's, that's the idea. So that's, that's the thing that's being executed here. So that's the half uh, roll, half loop followed by the half roll. And now the aircraft is actually flying in the opposite direction. Um, again, a very simple maneuver to perform. Um, Um, okay, here's now um, um, fully, f fully automated flight. Now our challenge is to do a complete takeoff uh, flight, um, some maneuver, and come back to land on the airstrip uh, without any external information. Uh, there's no GPS, by the way. That's one of our kind of cha self-imposed challenges. We want this thing to be entirely self-contained. So uh, we're collaborating with Boeing, a Boeing aircraft company now, and they're kind of interested in building a backup system that will allow aircraft to fly autonomously without the aid of, let's say there's a GPS break, breakdown or GPS denial. They'd like to be able to manage at least for some distance uh, without, without, uh, without any external aids. So the idea is to use just all the principles we've gleaned so far with, with insects, uh, optic flow to sense distance from the ground, um, horizon sensing to control attitude. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the cloud pattern in the sky or the sun. Uh, to control uh, direction of flight and see if you can do a completely autonomous uh, flight. So in this particular case, the mission is to take off uh, from the airport, uh, fly a certain distance, climb to a certain height. All this is done by monitoring the optic flow produced by the ground. Uh, and then you do an Immelman maneuver autonomously, fully, to do this half loop, half roll, then head back towards the runway and do a completely automatic landing. So that's, that's the mission. And so here's what we're seeing here. Let's start this. Um, just about to take off. These circles are the four cardinal directions, north, east, south, and south, north, east, and south, and west. Um, so we're taking off. Um, those white circles, those virtual white circles, those disks you see on the ground, um, they're being calculated by the visual odometry, and they represent estimated 20 meter forward travels on the ground as, you, as you're progressing. So that's what that's representing. So we're heading out, we're gaining altitude. At some point we'll do the turn, we'll do the Immelman turn to head back. There we go. That's the half loop and the half roll. And now we're heading back as you can see because we're retracing these uh, white circles. They're not planted the, planted the ground, but they're, they're virtual circles. The aircraft can't see these circles. <laughs> right, we're coming back, we're coming in back to land. 
So we're doing this purely by integrating odometry. I mean, we're not, of course, errors will build up as you go further and further away from the thing, and you, it's not perfect. We're just trying to see how far can you go with just visual odometry. And it seems like, at least for the short run, uh, it seems to work fairly well. Now, here's an example of an automated uh, landing, just to give an idea of how things work when you're landing. And here, because we're uh, fly working with a, a fixed-wing aircraft, we unfortunately cannot uh, do exactly what the B does, because with the B rule of landing, as you, as you remember, as you get closer and closer to the ground, you've got to fly arbitrarily slower and slower, right? Which you cannot do with a fixed-wing aircraft because you will stall. So we're slightly modifying the technique by using, um, you know, uh, measuring optic flow to work out how far we are from the ground, but not really doing the B strategy. We're starting to do the B one now with, with our quad rotors, but I don't have the data to show you that as yet. So what we've done here, this is a slight cheat. So it's a slight modification uh, of the B strategy. But basically what, the thing that, what happens is that the pilot brings the plane into land, faces it in the appropriate direction, and then says, yes, go ahead and land. And that's what this is doing. So the, the aircraft, the vision system is using a horizon profile to stabilize its yaw and pitch, uh, the optic flow from the ground to regulate its height, uh, and, and, and that's what's going on here. So here we come in. So that's the optic flow. As you can see over here in this left-hand panel, oh, I can't get, oh, there we go, that's the optic flow coming into land and it's a uh, nice smooth landing. Uh, it's quite a repeatable um, landing because, uh, in, in fact, it's better than some of our best uh, manual pilots. Young pilots are, find it harder to make these smooth landings, probably because uh, the automatic control system is, is quite reactive, really rapidly reactive, and it responds to wind, wind gusts uh, much better than um, humans do. Um, so just to give you an idea, here are two manual landings that are being compared. The, the, the pink curve shows you the profile of uh, height versus time. And as you can see, it's not very reproducible. These two manual landings are quite different in terms of you know, height versus time. Uh, but with the automatic case, two landings, uh, it's quite reproducible. And the impact on the ground, when you hit the ground, these are measured by these uh, z-axis accelerometers. Uh, they're comparable in the manual and the automatic, comparable or even actually slightly better. So the whole system seems to work uh, fairly well. And we've tested this under various conditions, for example, um, good weather conditions, um, rainy days, there's some, some of these images here. There's a montage of 72 different flights done under different conditions. Some of them actually quite cloudy and rainy. Seems to be pretty reliable. Um, here's a flight done and a landing done in a rainy day. It's not heavy rain, but it's you know a drizzle, a fair drizzle. But the horizon segmentation seems to still work fairly well. Um, just to give you some parameters on, on, on the performance statistics, uh, with the manual, um, you know, seven su su successful landings versus four failed landings. When we say failed, we mean a landing where the thing has touched down and not really necessarily hurt itself, but just tipped over, for example, leaned over to one side. We, we fairly stick. We call that a failure, right? Something where it's nice three-point landing, rolls to a halt, is considered to be a successful landing. So as you can see, the automatic landings are quite, quite, quite good. So 74 successful six failures, and usually the failures happen under high wind conditions. That's the only thing that's a problem, but it's not bad. Um, and uh, I'll finish off with this particular thing, which is a manual landing. This is not a typical manual landing, but let's say a manual landing. Not, not all the manual landings are that bad, but that, that's definitely something which classes a failure. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to finish by thanking all the various uh, you know funders over or, or, you know all all the years, and uh, thank you for your patience in staying this long. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Aha. It, there's a few questions I see. There you go. Well, first of all, must, I must congratulate you on the beautiful work you have done. Um, as you were talking, it occurred to me, um, there are two things that we, when we are born, affect us immediately or even before. One is gravitation and the other one is the magnetic field of the Earth. I was just wondering if the magnetic field of the Earth has anything to do with the orientation of the bees.
It's still not uh, totally, it's still controversial. Uh, people think they have found a, a magnetoreceptor receptor in, 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 the, in the back of the bee. Um, and there is some behavioral work suggesting that bees do respond to magnetic fields. But whether they really use it to orient is still not completely certain. It's a, but it's very interesting. We haven't put a magnetometer sense into the uh, aircraft as yet, but we could certainly use that. Uh, if, yeah. Um, as, as we're trying to not use that at the moment. But uh, the more we look at the people are finding that uh, more and more animals are, do have a magnetic sense. Uh, maybe we even have one that's become vestigial now when we don't use it anymore, don't even sense it anymore. But I think uh, a lot of creatures do have it. Can, excuse me, can you come back to the, the slide where you have a tunnel of six or eight meters, if that's possible? The, the, the There's a tunnel of six or eight oh, meters. Yeah, yeah. You have a slide sorry. on, okay. on uh, that That's one. the other one, isn't it? Uh -huh. Um, let see if I have that presentation there. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, this, this one, one is perfect, maybe? yeah. Now, I was wondering if whether or not you, do, you did the following experiment where you, you will be putting, let's say, two meters of vertical stripes and, let's say, four meters of horizontal one and two mm, meters, mm, mm. or four meters and there are four meters, to see if the, the bees yeah. could count we, we haven't done it. Uh, we haven't done it uh, you know, comprehensively in lots of different combinations. We've certainly done it uh, half and half, for example. And you find that, OK, if half the length of the tunnel is lined with vertical stripes, and the remaining half is lined with horizontal stripes, then the distance that's uh, measured by apparent distance measured by the bees corresponds to the, um, to the first half. Um, yeah. What I was trying to find out is whether or not, if you had, let's say, two meters, four meters, and two meters, whether or not they could count. Oh, two plus oh, two. oh. You mean count in the sense of physically count? Physically count. Oh, the that's distances. interesting. So, it, it, so if you have a regular texture, uh, they don't seem to count, but you can do, and this is a, <laughs> uh, some experiments we did some time ago. Um, if you, the, the, we are wondering whether bees could, if you have large prominent landmarks, whether they can count a, a certain number of landmarks and use that count to work out how far they've gone. In this case, with these gratings, you know, when you have a large number of stripes, it doesn't appear that they, can, they are counting because you can change the spatial frequency of the stripes, and it doesn't make any difference. But if you have large, distinct objects, and um, the way we do it is we train bees to find a feeder that is always placed after they've flown past three landmarks, for example, right? And because they're always trying to use the odometry, and we want to make sure they're not relying on the odometry, but learning, forcing them to learn to count, <laughs> okay? We, we change the distance to the feeder, but always make sure they fly past three landmarks, right? So if it's a very long distance, we spread the landmarks apart. If it's a very close distance, so bees are constantly flying past three landmarks and getting to the food source. And if you do that kind of experiment and test them, we find they can count up to four maximum. Four objects is the maximum they can count. It's not a great number, but four. <laughs> I, I like the, the uh, clever things that were done with the curved mirror and the other ways of sort of simplifying the optical field. And I wondered whether it was evidence that the compound eye of the insect or the visual apparatus might be doing any sort of analysis. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. Now, yeah, very, very good question, because we, did, we weren't thinking uh, uh, biologically at that time. But after we devised this shape, yeah. um, we discovered that uh, one of my colleagues, Jochen Zeil, uh, has found that uh, crabs that live on, on uh, flat, uh, sandy beaches, the way they map uh, the, 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 the flat surface onto their eye is such that um, equal angles uh, along, along, the, uh, along the eye correspond to equal distance increments along the ground. And they can use that to gauge how far away another creature is from them, a predator, uh, for example. So that seems to be another use of, uh, that, that mapping seems to be there too. Although when we did this uh, design, we were not, we hadn't thought about that. <laughs> yeah. But it's a later coincidence that, yeah. It was really great stuff. Um, I'll probably grab you afterwards for more questions, but I wanted to ask you about the, the B flight being determined uh, primarily here by vision. I mean, uh, is there any, is there any uh, indication that they're also using some kind of like proprioceptive feedback to determine their uh, the course of their flight? I mean, you mentioned gravity, well, anti-sun, anti-gravity direction uh -huh. as being indicative of the sun, or is it, 
So would that be the component uh, that's, you know, channel, uh, the channel is going through the proprioception, or is it the magnetic um, Well, in, 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 in the case of, uh, in the darkness of the hive, uh, measuring uh, the direction of gravity seems to happen, uh, at least people think, it's happening by looking at the way the various um, sort of organs of the bee hang with respect to the body, you know? So for example, um, if I'm a bee and I'm facing um, upwards uh, along the comb, then my, my, my head tends to drop against my chin like this. And bees have these bristles uh, in their chin, just like I do over here. <laughs> and, and those bristles act like proprioceptive sensors, and they tell which way the chin is um, you know, oriented. So if they're, if they're facing down, the, the head seems to hang out. If they're facing up, the chin is sort of tucked in. And they can tell which way the direction of gravity is using that as one possible view. The other cue people think is happening is um, the way the abdomen hangs relative to the thorax. If you're facing vertically upwards, the abdomen is in line with the thorax. If you tilt to one side, the abdomen tends to hang uh, closer to the direction of gravity, right? So if you have proprioceptors that measure the joint angle there between the thorax and the abdomen, you can work out what the direction of gravity is, or you can infer from that what the direction of gravity might be. That's what they think is going on. I don't think anyone's really sure yet. Very, very quick question about crosswind landings. Uh, you said that, that in windy conditions it was, the, is, and there are two techniques for crosswind landings. One is you crab the aircraft, yep. which means you have a, a mismatch between the optical flow. The other is you, you roll the aircraft, so you, you're not looking at the ground from one, one of your cameras. Did, did you experiment with any of that? Uh, this, uh, this, this is literally yeah. the crabbing, yeah. yeah. So the idea is the, the, the aircraft is programmed to make sure that the translational optic flow is parallel to the intended direction of travel. Hmm. And if you tell it to do that, it automatically crabs okay. when it when comes, comes across a crosswind. And then does because it, 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 it does it's constrained to keep the optic flow uh, right. in a particular direction uh, right. with respect to the, the, the cloud pattern of the sky, which defines your absolute directions, right? So you right. use that pattern to set your desired direction of motion. And so once you know what direction of optic flow you need to maintain, and if it's drifting off to one side, mm -hmm. you know you've got to crab to yeah. compensate for that. So it yeah. does that auto automatically as part of its control loop. And does it kick it straight before it lands, or do you destroy the undercarriage when you, <laughs> when you touch well, that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably where we have bad landing. We, yeah, that's a good point. We, we're not careful enough to, to correct it at the very last, and that's probably why we have some difficult landing in bad conditions. That's a good point. We've got to fix that. <laughs> uh, time for just a couple more. Uh, they're going to kick us out. Hi. Um, I've uh, two questions, basically. One, did you ever think of using uh, these neuromorphic biomimetic cameras that are supposed to mimic uh, the retina? Yeah, you, yeah, I mean, we, we, we did. I mean, um, we, we felt, you know, there's so many people doing lovely work in that area, you know, they're building these beautiful conformal optics, um, and we didn't want to get into that, um, simply because, you know, we probably wouldn't do such a good job. And my, my philosophy is, um, we want to be bioprincipic. We want to extract the principles and then test them. Um, we are not experts in the technology to build an exact device. And even if we did that, um, for us, it, I don't know if it will convey any advantage. You know, we, uh, it's so easy now to buy off-the-shelf components, which are, I, I, I grant they're not exactly what an animal has. But to test what we, our, our theories, we don't necessarily need that. You know? It but may be useful for other purposes. For example, if you, yeah, go on. Yeah, but did you use the same logic with the bees, with the airplane, to see whether they would fly closer to, if you had, like, stripes? Oh, yeah, they, they certainly would. I would say we could certainly make them fly down uh, narrow gorges using the same no. principle of balancing the flow. The airplane, so that mm. it would behave the same mm. way with, mm. the, like, the bees. Yeah, yeah, you I would. See. I mean, we didn't fly them down a tunnel, of course, but, but certainly... Uh, all of the other behaviors that these aircraft exhibit, and we've also, by the way, we've got... Um, uh, kind of a gantry uh, in the lab where we can simulate flights without flying aircraft all the time, and there we can test all of the things that uh, you know bees do, and you get the same result. Yeah, I mean you have to because, well, okay, maybe not, maybe you don't expect it. You can't say you have to because that's why we're doing these things, right? <laughs> we all have lots more questions, but we're going to have to stop now. We're uh, we're, we're time limited. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank that you, was thank fantastic. You. Uh, okay, thank you, and, and thanks for um, chairing the session, uh, Roger, and thanks uh, for all the session chairs and for everybody who's asked.